December 1992. Here in Oklahoma City and around the country, the spirit of Christmas is brightened by a sense of relief. The U.S. is beginning to emerge from a recession. But on Christmas Day, here at the city's convention center, a very different kind of spirit prevails. This footage shows the annual gathering of the Muslim Arab Youth Association. A TV reporter decides to see what's happening. I had discovered there was a radical Islamic convention with groups representing every single organization that I had read about, but never suspected that they were present in the United States. In an auditorium filled with supporters, the speakers call for a holy war, or jihad, against Jews and Christians. They blame the West and Israel for oppressing Muslims around the world. The organizers are even selling children's coloring books, such as this one, Extolling Martyrdom. From a payphone inside the convention center, the reporter calls his contacts in the FBI counterterrorism department. He describes the scene. And they said, we don't know what you're talking about. And I said, I'm here. I'm witnessing it. These are the groups. There's Hamas. There's the Islamic Jihad. There's the Muslim Brotherhood. They're making speeches in Arabic. They're calling for Jihad. Are you not aware of this? And they said, we don't know what you've been smoking. The FBI takes no known action based on the reporter's tip. But in cities all across America, extremist groups are busy recruiting followers and honing a message of hatred. I think that picture of the network of radical Islamic groups operating thoroughly below the radar screen in the United States tells the story of 9-11. Atlanta, a Palestinian radical is on a fundraising tour detailing his dark vision of jihad. Blood must flow. There must be widows. There must be orphans. Detroit. This event is hosted by a group called the Islamic Charity Project International. One of its main speakers is a blind Egyptian cleric calling for Islam to rule the world. We conquer the land of infidels and we spread Islam by calling the infidels to Allah. In Chicago, Pittsburgh, Tucson, and elsewhere, the radical preachers insist that the jihad will succeed. Oh, brothers, after Afghanistan, nothing in the world is impossible for us anymore. This Arab preacher is carrying his message of hate into the American heartland. But on the other side of the globe, he and a partner are also busy creating a jihad network, a network that will eventually plan and execute the deadliest act of terrorism in history. Afghanistan, 1980. It is here that the road to 9-11 begins. Afghan rebels known as Mujahideen, or holy warriors, launch a guerrilla campaign against the occupying Soviet army. Muslims from other nations join the fight. They are determined to expel the Soviets from a Muslim land. Just across the border in Pakistan is the city of Peshawar. Pakistan supports the rebels, and Peshawar becomes a haven for those drawn to the holy war. The city is abuzz with arms dealers, drug dealers, clerics, wounded warriors, and CIA agents. I always thought it, uh, those years looked to me a lot like the bar scene in Star Wars. Because, I mean, it was just a very weird, surreal existence. Among the thousands of Muslims who would answer the call to jihad, this young man, 
six foot five inches tall, dressed in the baggy trousers and long linen shirt of an Afghan peasant. He is Osama bin Laden. He is 24 years old. Bin Laden is the son of a billionaire construction magnate in Saudi Arabia. But here the young man sleeps on a mattress on the floor. His charitable work earns him the nickname Samaritan in the refugee camps and hospitals. Murfreesboro, North Carolina, spring 1983. As the Afghan war rages, another young Muslim is finding his own way to the holy war, starting from a tiny Baptist college. A group of Muslim students gather in this dormitory to pray. In the Islamic tradition, they leave their shoes outside the door. Other students would come and steal the shoes and throw them in the campus lake. Among the targets of the practical joke is this engineering major, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. He's the brainy and charming son of an imam, or Islamic priest. Khalid grew up in Kuwait, but his family comes from a remote region of Pakistan, and in Kuwait they are often treated like second-class citizens. His college years only deepen his resentment. When Khalid graduates, he heads to Pakistan. There, he joins one of his three brothers, who is running a charity for the Afghan rebels. 1984. Young Osama bin Laden uses some of his family fortune and contacts to bankroll a plan to create an international jihad network. It's the brainchild of radical cleric Abdullah Azam. Azam is a Palestinian whose hometown was occupied by Israel after the Arabs' crushing defeat in the Six-Day War. More than anyone, it is Azam who has inspired Muslims, including bin Laden, to head to Afghanistan. The men give their organization an unassuming name, the Office of Services. The headquarters in Pakistan supplies arms and training to volunteers headed to the front. 1986. By now, the Afghan war is turning in favor of the rebels. But Arab volunteers play only a small part. By far, the biggest factor is a shoulder-fired missile called the Stinger, courtesy of the CIA. The rebels start knocking Soviet helicopters out of the sky. Behind the scenes, bin Laden and Azam are opening branch offices of their jihad organization in 35 countries around the world. The U.S. will become a main focus. With a flagship outpost at this mosque, Al Farouk, here in Brooklyn, New York. They also set up shop in Boston, Chicago, Nashville, Atlanta, Sacramento, and 32 other cities. Many of the outposts are no more than a single individual raising money from an apartment or office. But the Jihad Network is laying a foundation for the future. It's creating an army of young men ready to fight the next battle in the Holy War. Jihad became a practical concept. It became approachable, accessible. It became something that empowered and mobilized the young masses within the Muslim world to start practicing a violent holy war. By the spring of 1987, Osama bin Laden has grabbed a rifle and joined the fighting. Soviet troops corner his band of Arab volunteers in the rugged hills of eastern Afghanistan in a place called Jaji. According to eyewitness accounts, 
One of bin Laden's comrades is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the young Muslim who studied engineering in North Carolina and who will become the engineer of 9-11. Soviet artillery and helicopter gunships bombard the men. As legend has it, after a month-long siege, the Arabs forced the Soviets to withdraw. The battle is widely reported in the Arab press. Overnight, the story turns bin Laden into a hero. Poets and singers celebrate the glory of the young Saudi warrior. This is sheer and utter nonsense. There is about a 15-second uh, piece of footage showing him with a, a radio and maybe a Kalashnikov hanging on his shoulder. And, and that's the great warrior. By the following summer of 1988, it's all but over for the once mighty Red Army. Soviet troops begin to withdraw. The Afghan rebels have won. I felt very gratified when we had the pictures of the Soviets crossing the various bridges out of Afghanistan and quite literally fleeing back to Russia. The victory electrifies the world of radical Islam. And the men who fought the battle of Jaji with bin Laden and Azam become the nucleus of a violent new force. It becomes known as the base. In Arabic, the name is Al-Qaeda. If not for the anti-Soviet multinational Afghan Jihad, Mujahideen from around the world would not have come to defeat one superpower and after that to turn their guns against another superpower the United States. November 1989. Bin Laden's partner, Abdullah Azam, is driving to a mosque in Peshawar, Pakistan with two of his sons. A car bomb explodes, killing them instantly. The murder, never solved, has the hallmarks of a mob rub out. With Azam out of the way, Bin Laden quickly reorganizes the Jihad network around himself. Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, August 1990. Bin Laden has returned home from the Afghan war. He hopes to use his family's vast wealth and political connections to grow his Al-Qaeda network of holy warriors. But the 33-year-old bin Laden is in for one of the biggest disappointments of his life. August 2, 1990. Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait and threatens the neighboring kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Bin Laden approaches the Saudi government with an offer. He will summon those who battled the Soviets. They will protect the kingdom from the Iraqi invaders. Only holy warriors, says bin Laden, should defend Islam's holiest sites. Instead, the Saudi royal family chooses the protection offered by US President George Bush. Bin Laden was politely turned down and uh, told that Kuwait is not Afghanistan. Thank you, don't call us, we'll call you. The Saudis let US troops use their kingdom as a staging area from which to drive Saddam from Kuwait. It's a devastating blow to bin Laden. It was that personal humiliation that led him to become the number one terrorist in the world. For bin Laden, the U.S. troops massing in the desert are living proof that the United States is the great infidel and that all U.S. allies in the Middle East are enemies of Allah. He begins to spread the word to his followers that the Saudi royal family must be overthrown. At the same time, 
Bin Laden's far-flung jihad network is roaring to life. New York, November 5th, 1990. This 34-year-old Egyptian named El Said Nasser dons the yarmulke of an observant Jew and pockets a 357 Magnum revolver. Nasser belongs to the Al Farouk Mosque in Brooklyn, a top jihad outpost in the U.S. Nasser enters a ballroom at this Midtown Manhattan hotel. Rabbi Meir Kahani head of the tiny but violent Jewish Defense League, is finishing a speech to his followers. As Kahani steps down from the podium, Nasser pulls out the gun, fires twice, and a fatal shot enters the rabbi's throat. Nasser flees the hotel, but an armed postal officer shoots him, and police arrest him. For the public, and largely for law enforcement, the killing of Kahana was portrayed as one crazy Arab killing one crazy Jew. That wasn't the case. We all now realize that was really the first, first major incident on U.S. soil that the radical Islamists conducted, the ones that we currently know today as al Al-Qaeda. FBI and police search Nosaire's home here in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. They find more than a thousand rounds of ammunition, bomb-making formulas, U.S. military training manuals, and a hit list of other prominent Jews. They haul 47 boxes of this material to this police precinct. It's a treasure trove of intelligence. But the authorities, the DA, the NYPD, the FBI, overlook most of it. While the FBI investigates some suspicious individuals at the Al Farouk Mosque, they do not investigate the mosque itself. So they fail to establish that the mosque is being used as a front by a terror cell with connections to bin Laden and his growing jihad network. The FBI at that time was working under a very tight set of guidelines, which made it ex extremely difficult to collect information inside any kind of religious organization, and, and certainly any church or mosque. All it took was that people in the FBI and the CIA to do their job and talk to each other and connect the dots and share the intelligence. If that had happened on the road to 9-11, it wouldn't have happened. The next step on the road to 9-11 will be a casual conversation between two boyhood friends who want nothing more than to come to America and blow up buildings. Khartoum, Sudan, April 1991. Osama bin Laden moves with his four wives, numerous children, and a core group of supporters here to this poor capital city in East Africa. Bin Laden is now living in exile from his native Saudi Arabia. He cuts a deal with the radical Islamic government of Sudan. Al-Qaeda provides money and weapons in return for sanctuary. From his new headquarters, bin Laden keeps an eye on activities in the land of his new mortal enemy, the United States. Brooklyn, New York, November 1991. Members of the Al Farouk Mosque are raising funds for the defense of El Said Nasser. Nasser is about to go on trial for the murder of Rabbi Meir Kahani. Osama bin Laden personally contributes $20,000 to the Legal Defense Fund. Outspoken civil rights attorney William Kunstler is hired to defend Nasser. Eyewitnesses testify 
they saw Nocer crouched by Kahani holding a gun. But Kunstler convinces the jury that no scientific evidence links Nocer to the shooting. The Egyptian is found guilty only of a minor weapons charge. Nocer had been pretty much a nobody, and overnight, the murder of Kahani vaulted him from nobody status to somebody who was in the Jihad Hall of Fame. Pakistan, summer 1992. A young Pakistani named Ramzi Youssef has just finished a course in bomb making at an Al-Qaeda training camp. The 24-year-old, nicknamed the chemist, likes to wear Armani suits. He holds an electrical engineering degree from a technical college in Wales. He's talking on the phone with a boyhood friend, Abdul Murad. He tells Murad his goal in life, to go to America, blow up buildings and kill Jews, as many as he can. Murad gives him an idea. Murad says, well, you know, there are a lot of Jews in New York. Uh, and later tells him, you know, there are a lot of Jews working at the World Trade Center. From this conversation, an idea takes shape and a plan is put in motion. New York, September 1st, 1992. A Pakistani Airlines flight from Karachi lands here at Kennedy Airport. Seated in the first class cabin, Ramzi Youssef. He's traveling with a Palestinian terrorist named Ahmad Ajaj. The two men exit the plane and approach parallel stalls at an immigration post. The six-foot-tall Youssef, dressed in a three-piece silk Afghan suit, presents a perfectly forged Iraqi passport. He demands political asylum. When immigration officials question Ajaj, they discover that he's carrying several crudely fake passports and a suitcase stuffed with bomb-making manuals. If he'd been wearing a t-shirt that said terrorist, he couldn't have been more clear that he was up to no good. Immigration agents take Ajaj into custody. They assign him a bed at this INS detention facility. But Youssef is allowed into the US and told to appear at an immigration hearing. The men's performance has worked like a charm. Ajaj creates such a stir and commotion and smokescreen that Ramzi Youssef, the Mozart of Tara, is able to slip into America. Youssef trolls the airport cab stand until he finds a Pakistani driver. He hands the cabbie a slip of paper with an address, 552 Atlantic Avenue, Brooklyn. Brother, I have just arrived from Karachi, he says. I have friends who will pay. The driver takes him here to the Al Farouk Mosque. Youssef receives the blessings of a blind Egyptian cleric who is now in charge of the mosque, Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman. The blind Sheikh, as he is known, is an ally of Osama bin Laden. He has approved Youssef's plan to place a truck bomb in the basement of the World Trade Center. Throughout the fall and winter, Youssef and three other members of the Al Farouk Mosque are hard at work inside this storage facility in Jersey City, New Jersey, just across the Hudson River from Manhattan. Under Youssef's direction, they assemble the device they hope will topple the Twin Towers and kill thousands of people. February 26, 1993. Two strands of Islamic terrorism converge for an attack on this symbol of America's global dominance. The blind sheikh provides the manpower and inspiration. Ramzi Youssef, the bomb-making expertise. Hovering in the background is the growing Al-Qaeda network, 
led by Osama bin Laden. Youssef packs a rented rider truck with a volatile mixture of 1,500 pounds of fertilizer, fuel oil, and nitroglycerin. Around noon, he and three colleagues park the truck in a garage two stories beneath the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Minutes later, Youssef lights the fuse with a cheap cigarette lighter and speeds off. Twelve seventeen p.m. The bomb rips a seven-story hole right through the tower's core. Six people are killed. It became clear that this was a declaration of war, and it was a, a campaign that was being waged and a campaign that was being planned. Across the river, Youssef watches a column of smoke rise over lower Manhattan. He knows he has failed. The bomb was not powerful enough. He was disappointed that he hadn't sent Tower 1 crashing into Tower 2. And from that moment on, Ramzi Youssef vowed that he or his operatives would return to New York and finish the job he'd started in 1993. That night, Youssef makes his way to New York's JFK airport. Before the bombing, he had drafted a letter claiming credit for the attack on behalf of what he calls the 5th Battalion of the Liberation Army. According to an FBI source, Youssef calls one of his fellow terrorists from the airport. He dictates a new ending to the letter. It states, our calculations were not very accurate this time. However, we promise you that next time it will be very precise. And the Trade Center will be one of our targets. With that, Youssef boards his flight and flies first class to Karachi, Pakistan. It's hard for me to express to people how dangerous these guys really are and the dedication and fervor of their beliefs, their extreme desire to want to destroy Western civilization. Ramzi Youssef is so determined to strike another, more devastating blow against the West that he will now play a key role in hatching the plot that becomes 9-11. Pakistan, July 1994. The U.S. State Department distributes 37,000 matchbooks throughout Pakistan. They have this picture of terrorist Ramzi Youssef on the cover. They promise a $2 million reward for information leading to his capture. Over the past year, since the truck capture, over the past year, since the truck bombing of the World Trade Center, the FBI has discovered bank records and fingerprints showing that Youssef was the mastermind. The young engineer with a weakness for Armani suits is indeed living in his native Pakistan. But Youssef's well protected by the country's radical Islamic community. And he is still stung by his failure to topple the Twin Towers. Ramsey has no shortage of plans. I mean, this guy is like, he's going to assassinate Benazir Bhutto. He's going to blow up the American consulate in Karachi. He's going to attack a nuclear plant. You name it, he was, he was ready to go. August 1994, in a deserted warehouse here in the bustling city of Lahore, Pakistan, Youssef is teaching his childhood friend, Abdul Murad, how to build bombs. Youssef calls it making chocolate. Murad has returned to Pakistan after two years training at flight schools in Texas, North Carolina, and New York. It was Murad who gave Youssef the idea to bomb the World Trade Center. 
Now the two men are brainstorming again, coming up with ingenious ways to kill lots of civilians. At one point, Murad thought, you could take a plane, you could turn a plane into a bomb. You could fly it into a building, and you kill a lot of people with it. Karachi, Pakistan. The two young men meet at a restaurant on Tariq Road. They discuss the airplane idea with someone who could help make it happen. That someone is Ramzi Youssef's well-connected uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who studied engineering in North Carolina and then fought alongside Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan. They propose a suicide mission to fly a commercial jet loaded with fuel into CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. Youssef's uncle is intrigued and wants to know more. Since the Afghan war, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed has been traveling through China, Malaysia, Qatar, Bosnia, and Brazil, raising money to support the jihad cause. He presses his nephew's old friend Murad for details about the length of pilot training, the screening process, even the addresses of U.S. flight schools. The obvious person to fund such a scheme would be Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's fellow Afghan war veteran, Osama bin Laden. Khartoum, Sudan, 1994. For the past three years, Osama bin Laden has been running Al-Qaeda from his headquarters here in East Africa. Al-Qaeda is now an international terrorist organization with operatives in Egypt, Yemen, Somalia, Bosnia, and Chechnya. At this point, Al-Qaeda begins to appear on the CIA's radar screen. The agency gives the White House a briefing that mentions bin Laden. It calls his headquarters in Sudan, quote, the Ford Foundation of Sunni Islamic Terrorism giving grants for violent attacks around the world. We had a, a lot of circumstantial evidence. We weren't quite sure what it meant. Was bin Laden really a threat, or was he just another Saudi spendthrift who was throwing money around to radicals? He seemed to be coming up everywhere. He was like Elvis. Every time you read about a terrorist group in a different country carrying out violent action, you heard the name Osama bin Laden, and you wondered whether it was just sort of a fictional person. Agents based in Sudan are authorized to keep an eye on bin Laden, but nothing more. You have to understand that our charter was to collect intelligence. We did not have a charter to conduct action. There was no um, arrest warrant on Osama bin Laden. All the while, Al-Qaeda is expanding its reach and influence. While bin Laden consolidates power and contacts from behind the walls of his gated compound, Al-Qaeda members compile a 10-volume, 7,000-page how-to manual for terrorists. Al-Qaeda training camps are terrorist assembly lines, churning out Muslim warriors who then return home, ready to die for the jihad. For every person you trained, he was supposed to go back and train one or two persons. And then those people would train someone else, and it kind of grew uh, exponentially. And these guys are run like an intelligence organization, and we know some of the people who trained them. They have great patience. By the end of 1994, three such patient men, deeply committed to the Jihad movement, Ramzi Youssef, his friend Abdul Murad, and his uncle Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, are nurturing the most ambitious terrorist plot in history. Manila, the Philippines, January 6th, 1995. The mastermind of the World Trade Center truck bombing, Ramzi Youssef, has relocated here from his native Pakistan.
In this six-story building on President Carino Boulevard, Youssef has set up a terror workshop with his old friend, Abdul Murad. He has transformed the kitchen into a bomb factory. As Youssef cooks up explosives by the sink, the concoction accidentally ignites. The acrid smoke drives the two men from their apartment. It attracts the attention of the Philippine National Police. Youssef escapes to a nearby karaoke bar, but he sends Murad back to his apartment to retrieve his Toshiba laptop, which he uses to store his plans for terror attacks. Police arrest Murad as he tries to flee. They also seize the laptop. Youssef is watching from across the street. Within hours, he buys a first-class ticket to Singapore and slips out of the country. Days later, at this Philippine military base, members of the Philippine National Police are interrogating Abdul Murad. He refuses to say much. Police beat him until his ribs break. They extinguish cigarettes in his ears and on his genitals. They force so much water down his throat, he nearly drowns. After a month, he finally cracks. He reveals details of terrorist schemes that he developed with Ramzi Youssef. One was a plot to kill Pope John Paul II. Another was to use an ingenious detonator designed by Youssef to blow up 12 American jetliners over the Pacific Ocean. Murad confesses that he personally was planning to dive bomb a plane into CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. According to this man, Philippine Colonel Rodolfo Mendoza, Morad describes another far more daring operation. Teams of hijackers would use commercial jetliners as missiles against landmark buildings within the United States. They had up to 10 Islamic terrorists training in U.S. flight schools. That plot was well in motion, and Ramzi Youssef had it all on his Toshiba laptop. They had up to seven targets, including the Trade Center, the Pentagon, a nuclear facility, CIA headquarters, the Sears and Transamerica Towers, and the White House. Colonel Mendoza insists that he shared all this information with the FBI. The FBI acknowledges receiving intelligence from Mendoza, but claims there were no details about the plot that became 9-11. By now, the FBI's $2 million reward for information on Youssef finally yields a tip. Islamabad, Pakistan, February 7th, 1995. U.S. authorities confirm that Youssef is hiding out in a safe house. The building is owned by Osama bin Laden. A team of American and Pakistani agents race through Islamabad toward the Sukasa guest house. They literally jumped out of the cars, ran up the steps, kicked in the door of his hotel, and he was laying in bed. They arrest Youssef and take him into custody. His uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is in another room of the same Al-Qaeda safe house. But the uncle walks away into the shadows of radical Islam's underground network. And it now becomes Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's mission to carry out the idea developed with his nephew for flying commercial planes into American landmarks. Within 36 hours of Youssef's arrest, FBI agents are transporting him by helicopter to a New York City jail 
to await trial. The pilot passes the Twin Towers. One of the FBI agents lifts Yousef's hood and points toward the World Trade Center. See, it's still standing, he says. Ramzi Yousef replies that if he'd had enough time and money, he would have brought the whole thing down. Asmara, Eritrea, summer 1996. A young man walks into the U.S. Embassy in this tiny East African nation just across from Saudi Arabia. The informant tells U.S. officials that he has recently been caught embezzling more than $110,000 from Osama bin Laden's headquarters in Sudan. He fears for his life. The young Sudanese man agrees to tell U.S. authorities everything he knows about bin Laden and the Jihad network. They designate him confidential source number one and bring him to the U.S. for questioning. The defector tells U.S. prosecutors the names of key members of al-Qaeda's hierarchy. He also describes bin Laden's recruitment methods. Some of the things he told us, for example, about you know, people signing contracts to join al-Qaeda, I thought at first that was laughable and thought, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, people are going to sign paperwork and have personnel files. But I think that's when the light bulb went off and we started thinking of him differently than a financier, and he became an operational terrorist leader. It is now clear to American officials that bin Laden is much more than a rich Saudi playboy, frittering away his wealth on the jihad cause. He is instead the mastermind of a global terrorist conspiracy to kill Americans. Jalalabad, Afghanistan, summer 1996. Bin Laden has returned to the country that launched his career as a holy warrior. He's back here because the US and the UN have pressured the government of Sudan to end its cozy arrangement with the Al-Qaeda leader. They kick him out. So he arrives in Afghanistan in the early summer of 1996. And what does he do? The first thing he does is retreat to a camp outside of Jalalabad. And he writes a very long declaration of war against the United States. Bin Laden calls for a new holy war to evict US troops from Saudi Arabia. He intends to launch this jihad from his base in Afghanistan. It sent shockwaves through us. It was pretty clear from the first that bin Laden meant what he said, but it didn't catch much attention. September 1996. A radical Islamic sect called the Taliban seizes control of the Afghan government and its capital city, Kabul. In exchange for millions of dollars in al-Qaeda funding, the Taliban agreed to provide a haven for bin Laden and his organization. The CIA's newly created bin Laden unit learns that al-Qaeda has a military committee planning operations against U.S. interests worldwide, and that bin Laden has tried to acquire nuclear and chemical weapons. At his new headquarters, bin Laden starts taking meetings with terrorists looking to get their pet projects funded. They waited for freelancers to come by and say, listen, I have a project. Um, I'm going to attack this, or I'm going to blow up that, or I'm going to assassinate this person. And if they really liked the project a lot, then they would uh, fund it quite a bit. Um, and it sort of operated like a franchise. One of these freelancers is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Sometime in the middle of 1996, he reunites with fellow Afghan war veteran Osama bin Laden at bin Laden's camp in Tora Bora, Afghanistan. Since the arrest a year earlier of his nephew, Ramzi Youssef, he has been identified by the FBI as a terrorist. In fact, U.S. intelligence will begin referring to him by his initials, KSM. He fled to Afghanistan just as FBI agents were closing in. KSM pitches bin Laden several ideas he developed with his nephew. Among them is a highly ambitious plot 
to fly commercial jets into American landmark buildings, including the World Trade Center. Bin Laden listens to the idea. He knows that if it were to succeed and the U.S. retaliated against Al-Qaeda, it would be exactly what he wants, a battle with the great Satan on his own turf. Together, KSM and Bin Laden will begin to develop the details for what they call the planes operation. They will train teams of men to hijack U.S. commercial airliners and use them as missiles to attack symbols of American power. And before long, Bin Laden will start proclaiming his jihad directly to the American people. We do not differentiate between those dressed in military uniforms and civilians. He said, I predict a black day for the United States, a day uh, after which the United States will not be the same as we know it. In the years to come, the Al-Qaeda leader will provide a number of signs that such a black day is indeed coming. Just how black a day is something Americans are unable to imagine.